Our third panel for today will discuss if liberalism is compatible with national identity. This session will be moderated by Dato Saifuddin Abdullah, CEO of Global Movement of Moderates, and the panelists are Dr. Wang Ching Huat, Fellow and Head of Political and Social Analysis at the Penang Institute, Khalid Jaffa, Executive Director of Institute Kajian Dasa, and Dato Rohaini Ahmad, Supreme Council Member of Perkasa. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon all of you. Uh, brothers and sisters, um, I purposely put Rohani, Dr. Rohani, to be flanked by two liberals. Uh, now he's claiming he is a liberal, so that's, that's <laughs> see? So it works, it works. Uh, politics is about uh, where you sit and also about timing. <laughs> um, well, Tunku Abidin, uh, that was an excellent speech uh, as always, but I like the last part of it, the anecdotes. So, uh, give hand, a big hand to Tunku. Uh, it is not always that Malaysians look uh, uh, and await for the first day of the parliament sitting. Not like many Malaysians are now awaiting for 19 October the first day of the next sitting, uh, seeing, of, uh, you know, trying to uh, understand whether or not uh, Parliament will have its first ever uh, vote of confidence or vote of non-confidence. So, but that is as far as Malaysian Parliament is concerned. Our topic for this afternoon is, is liberalism compatible with national identity? And we have uh, before us three very distinguished speakers. I don't have to introduce them, or uh, Doctor, except uh, you know, uh, brief mentioning uh, Doctor Ching Huat, who is from, uh, who is the fellow and head of political and social analysis of Penang Institute. Uh, in the middle is uh, Dr. Rohani Ahmad, a former MP from AMNO, now Supreme Council member of Perkasa. Uh, and uh, at the uh, leftmost is uh, not necessarily the leftist of all the three speakers, uh, Pakale Jaffa, Executive Director of uh, Institute Kajianda Sa. Now, uh, my take uh, on liberalism in Malaysia, or rather my observation in as far as discussion I don't really want to say discourse, but discussion on liberalism probably occurs in two spheres of narrative. Uh, the, first, the first sphere is uh, rather formal, involving, uh, for instance, government and politics. The second sphere is quite informal, uh, involving the general public, but each of the two spheres have its own sub-spheres. Uh, within the first sphere, which is government and politics, you have sub-spheres which are quite open to discussing liberal ideas or liberalism, but you also have one or two sub-spheres which are sometimes even allergic to the word liberal and liberalism. Some, if they happen to be in the position of power, may even impose their idea in a certain way, like uh, uh, introducing fatwas and what have you, and uh, prosecute some people, whether they are Shia, whether they are sisters in Islam. Within the public sphere also, you can see pockets or subsets of the spheres. The middle ground, i.e. the young, the professional, the technocrats, the academic, the media, maybe the media, depending which media you are talking about, may be open to discussion on the realism, whereas the other may also be very jumpy and very you know, uh, tightly, but they may not want to discuss it. Some may also have this allergy of the word liberal or liberalism. 
So these are the kind of uh, framing of the discussion, or rather this is where the discussion of liberalism are situated in, in as far as Malaysia is concerned. And it is in this context, though the speakers need not necessarily agree with my framework, we are discussing is liberalism compatible with national identity. Each of the speakers will be allocated about 10 minutes or not more than 10 minutes. I know there is a very, uh, or they are given seven minutes and I have a very able, uh, dutiful uh, uh, timekeeper watching after the three speakers. We will, we, they will speak in the order of the book as been printed here, starting with uh, Ching Huat, followed by Pak Khalid, and then the Dr. Rohani. So, yes, brothers, Silakan. Ching Huat first. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thanks to Ideas and University of Nottingham for inviting me to share my thoughts. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Now, uh, I think when we approach this question, you basically need to ask two questions. First, which nation? Right. Now this is uh, September 16 rally and the words say Malaysia belongs to the Malays. Uh, September 16 was the 52nd anniversary of Malaysia. Now, that was what it was 52 years ago. It was a different nation, so you need to ask that question. When we talk about poorer society, when we talk about Malaysia, uh, the difference between Malaya and Malaysia is that Malaysia, you like it or not, it is a poorer society uh, by design because that's the outcome of uh, you know, the Cold War and the communalism considerations, calculations. But if you come back to Malaya, there are many people who dread the fact that we were actually a colonial, sorry, we are a poorer society and they would like to blame it on the colonial rule. Uh, and uh, those who have gone through the f official education, the, the public education system, you'll be familiar with the name uh, J.S. Furnival, who basically described uh, poor society in a rather negative way. People mix but do not combine. They just meet in the marketplace and so on. I want to put a bit of context to that narrative because like it or not, it will come out very frequently. Pro society is the outcome of not just colonization, but also modernization. Now, uh, what happened in the past two centuries, uh, sorry, in the 18th and 19th century basically transformed this part of the world into three groups. You have first the Malay Muslim, uh, deliberately under the colonial policy kept as farmers and fishermen to avoid social disruption. And then you have the liberal uh, aristocrat elites then you had the non-Muslim Bumi Putras. They were enemies, converted to Christians uh, because of uh, under the colonial time, and that checked the advancements of Islam into, into the inland. Now, thirdly, then you have the Chinese and the Indian immigrants who were brought in uh, for modern economic sectors. Now, if you go back to why this argument about who, you know, to whom this country belongs to, you go back to all the questions and say, how do you deal with this? Uh, just want to put one more line. Uh, if you wonder why that it was so, there was such a strong anti-Chinese sentiment, it was because of the last part. The Chinese and the Indians were seen as a byproduct of colonial rule. The Malays never invited the Chinese and Indians to be here. They were imposed on them uh, in the 19th century onward. Now, this is a fact that probably you have missed from your textbook. Now, this, uh, uh, the first one is Yap Aloy, the founder of Kuala Lumpur. And he controlled Kuala Lumpur by 1869. He moved in here 1861. Britain controlled Selangor only by 1874. The next one is Chen Kui Yi from Taiping. He started mining in Rarut by 1860. Britain controlled Para only in, by 1984, by 1874. Now, Tan Yeok Yi is more interesting. Uh, Tengku mentioned just now about the Johor Sultanates. 
He became mayor of China Johor in 1870, and Britain came 45 years later. This is a fact that you wouldn't read in your textbook because it makes the story a bit more complicated. The Chinese were brought in, just like the Bangladeshi today, and uh, the Burmese, the Nepalese, and so on, to fill an economic need. And you know, you like if you like the liberal idea of borderless movement of people. It was the Malay who brought them in before the British. In fact, it was the British who stopped the Kangchu system in Johor two years after they controlled Johor. So the first question I say we need to ask is that which nation? Are we talking about an imaginary Tanam Layu or you're talking about a Malaysia? Next. Uh, before that, if you go further on that, then the implication of that is that if you deny you, you deny the uh, legitimacy of pluralism, plural, plural society, then of course you have trouble with democracy, with secularism, and with liberalism. And if you read the one picture next to it, you probably it's a bit too hard for you to read. I'll translate into English. We oppose Barisan National not because they're long in power, but because they preserve the colonial constitution, the infidels' laws and the pre-Islamic rules. That is the most important part of Amanat Hadi by Hadi Awan. That captures a different way of nation building. If we want to overcome that, I think we need a more sophisticated view of our colonial past. Next. Next question is, uh, which liberalism? But before that, let me just put it a simple uh, positions of how I see liberalism is basically against cohesion. At the end of the day, you believe that people has reason to resort to to make decision. They know what's best for themselves. Well, not all the time people make the best decision, but the assumption is that most of the people, most of the time, for most of the time, most of the people are rational. So they should be allowed to dictate their life. And for that reason, we oppose strong government. We oppose uh, the tyranny of the majority and so on. And why do I put Panado up there? Um, well, because it, to me, it captures the spirit of necessary evil. We take Panado because our body is ill. It's an evil. But you need it because your body is ill. However, if you get addicted to Panado, you are called a drug addict. So next, which liberalism? This is the part that I want to challenge. I hope I can do my job in two minutes. Uh, or if our timekeeper would be more liberal on this, I want to read this. John Stuart Mill, free institutions are next to impossible in a country made up of different nationalities, among our people without fellow feeling, especially if they speak and read and speak different languages. The united public opinion necessary to the working of representative government cannot exist. Now, if you lament that why we have so many different types of school, you know, why we are so diverse, blame it on John Stuart Mill. Because he's, he was an English and not an Indian. Had he been an Indian, he would have taken different. That picture was in Southern Thailand. The Buddhist and the Muslim speak Thai, the same language. They fight. Next. <coughs> secularism. If you go on this line, yes to secularism, but no to multilingualism. And that's the Tower of Babel. A God divides and rules. Now, which liberalism? There's another view from the Anglo Saxon world. This is actually from uh, James Madison. I'm not going to read the whole thing. His idea is that if a society is too homogeneous, then you would have tyranny of majority. He, what he calls as factions. For that reason, you actually need diversity. Why? To check on each other. So we can't, we can't do harm on each other. It's not that we're going to be better people. It's just that, realistically, it's not possible for you to do that. And this is a part of liberalism I would like to go further. Next. Well, uh, we have German friends here. I'm quite sure they're very familiar with this. The danger of unity. 
If you see this guy, he was holding his handbag. But that he represents a different, a very precious German conscience at that point. The question go back that say, is liberalism compatible with nationality? I think the question we need to ask is that, do we love to love our country or do we have to love our country? Loving country is a good thing. The difference here is that, should you be forced to love it? Or should you just fall in love? That's ultimately what the difference between liberalism and what its opponents are. Next. So national identity, I think it should be what Malay call rumparatus, spices. That if you're going to be so homogeneous, life would be so boring. Now I would like to end this. I'm not sure whether Ustaz uh, Zai is still here. Uh, well, yes, our Hujarat 13. All mankind, indeed, we have created you from male and female and made your people, make you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Indeed, Allah is knowing and acquainted. The point here is that uh, there's a better quote. I just got it, so I didn't get in time to put it in. Let me read this and I'll end it. That's from Surat al Mada 48. To each of you, we prescribe, uh, sorry, uh, just go straight to that. Had Allah will, he would have made you one nation, united in religion. The point here is that diversity is part of our nature. And liberalism, at the end of the day, is allow us to be who we are and not what we are told that we are supposed to be. To me, that's recognizing the value of humanities because we are not ends at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shin uh, Your ending uh, reminded me of uh, one of the uh, points that I raised uh, in one other public a discussion which get me into some kind of trouble. Well, I can't really remember which public discourse I entered that I didn't get into trouble anyway. So. <laughs> uh, when I say Muslims in this country need to understand the other better, and in order to do that, you have to understand the other in the real sense of the word, and perhaps this is where it is not really, it is not relevant to use the traditional way of looking at disbelievers as uh, Kafir Zimmi protected disbelievers, definitely not Ka Kafir Harbi uh, disbelievers who are at war with you, but to look at them as brotherhood and sisterhood in citizenship. Now I get into trouble for saying that. Uh, well, Dato Rohani, you are next. Oh, sorry, uh, Pak Khalid. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Tuh Saifuddin, Chairman, uh, Ustaz Wong Chin Wat, Datuk <laughs> Rohani, uh, Cik Kwa Bidin, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, let me thank uh, Ideas and University of Nottingham for inviting me to participate in an important discussion on the relationship between liberalism and national identity. It is my belief that liberalism is an integral part of our national identity. I think my approach, uh, I would consider what I'm going to present here just a minor footnote to a very persuasive speech made by Jungkook Abidin just now. I'm taking it almost the same line. First, let me say that there have been liberal before liberalism as has been persuasively argued by Quentin Skinner in his little book, Liberty Before Liberalism. Although Skinner study is confined to Europe, it can be extended to include other civilizations. The notion of human freedom and dignity, which are core values in liberal philosophy, is well articulated by the Prophet Muhammad in his last sermon. On top of that, the Prophet Muhammad perhaps the only religious leader known to have a very pro-market attitude, a fundamental element in classical liberalism. 
with his famous say only god pays prices i think one side for must have uh, agreed with that however while religions have been preaching human dignity the institution of slavery existed from time immemorial until modern time abraham lincoln have to wage a bloody civil war to end slavery but earlier than that 1834 the british anti slavery abolition act came into force abolishing slavery throughout the british empire including malaya one of the most enlightened and liberal initiative of the first british resident j w w birch was to abolish slavery which resulted in his murder so we have a liberal matter in this country <laughs> One very fundamental liberal legacy of the Malay Sultanates was free trade. Free trade did not come to this country with British. It was there from the very beginning in Malacca, in the um, Srivijaya, and in the Johor Sultanate, in the Buddhist, uh, in the Bugis as well as Minangkabau uh, Sultanate. They are all free traders. it was there from the very beginning when we get independent this liberal legacy was weighted into weighted into modern liberal achievement namely constitutional government parliamentary democracy and modern rule of law tunku abdul rahman's declaration of independence or pemasyhuran kemerdekaan is an authentic liberal document so do the federal constitution and the malaysian the de- and, and the malaysian declaration it is interesting that the tunku was making the malaysian declaration for masyuran malaysia on behalf of umat malaysia this is a term he used it's very interesting it's a very significant the term umat is very significant it is a term used by the prophet muhammad in the madina charter described by professor muhammad hamidullah at the first written constitution in the world he used the term ummatan wasatan a single nation which include the muslim the jews and the non muslim residents of medina ustaza patricia to correct me he was a far uh, uh, profound student of islamic history than me myself then most of us here in this room based on the living based on this living history document one can surmise that the country and the nation imagined by our founding fathers tunku abdul rahman tun tan cheng lok tun sam bantan is to all intent and purposes is a liberal one they are living documents and they are all liberal because they and the philosophy they contain are the glue that bind our countries and its people together when the country was threatened with racial riots in 1969 our leaders forged a national ideology the rukun negara rearticulating this liberal principle to secure peace harmony and security for the country and among the rakyat be then as it may The Rukun Negara made more pronounced the primacy of religion and ethical values as the bedrock of nationhood. I see this Rukun Negara as our significant contribution to the emerging Asian liberalism and inflection to European liberalism whose growth and development unfortunately has been coterminous with the thinning of religious commitment it is unfortunate perhaps reflecting his confused state of mind the prime minister has warned the muslim in this country on the danger posed by liberalism to islam mentioned by tuku abidin just now so what he was saying amount to this the basic structure of our country and modern government is a threat to islam what could be more ridiculous 
The prime minister's confusion is perhaps due to uncritical adoption of the Indonesian Ulama Council Fatwa in 2005. Yeah, we know all that fatwa. Uh, they call it uh, syphilis. Yeah. Secularism, pluralism, and liberalism. They are threats again of Islam. The Indonesian call it syphilis. One must understand the depth of anti-liberal thought in Indonesia. Its founding fathers, Sukarno, Hatta, Sultan Shahril, and Tan Malaka, were all deeply influenced by Marxism. Even Nahdlatul Ulama, the biggest Muslim organization in Indonesia, was partner in was partner with Indonesian Communist Party, Party Communist Indonesia (PKI) in Sukarno Nasakom government. Sukarno former government based on Nasakom, uh, 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 the joining of a combination of nationalism, Islam, and communism. Very imaginative. But our leader, from the very beginning, were fervently anti communist. However, creeping authoritarianism coupled with deficit in liberal discourse have resulted in accumulation in misunderstanding on liberalism. But I am hopeful, well, I've been involved in almost more than a decade in educating the younger generation undergraduates on liberalism and enlightenment. Yeah. After one decade of involving in publication and activities, one can see that there is a renewed interest on liberalism among the younger generation. More younger generation are discovering liberalism and rediscovering the liberal components of their national identity. This morning, I was attending the joint Muqtamar of WADA, Abib, and PKPIM. By the way, Dato Saifuddin is uh, former president of PKPIM. Am I right? Deputy president. I only reached to vice president. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> At that time, not now. Yeah. Uh, I attended the Muqtamar. This, this are Muqtamar of three biggest Muslim organizations uh, in, in Malaysia. Yeah. I'm impressed, especially with the speech of Muhammad Fazil uh, Saleh, the current PKPM president, yeah, which exhibit openness uh, towards enlightenment and liberalism. And, and his speech is peppered with quotation from Immanuel Khan, Sapare Aude, enlightenment, and all those Good words yeah, of liberal discourse. Yeah. I think what we need to do is uh, to do more education and promotion what I can call as Ruko Nagara liberalism. Not Western liberalism, not European liberalism, but Ruko Nagara liberalism. Yeah. Uh, liberalism that is uh, for Malaysian context and to expound the idea of freedom, responsibility, free market as an integral part of our national identity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, in his presentation, Saldaga Khalid was being very, was, he, he took a very uh, politically correct line because he mentioned two words without naming the person behind those words. He mentioned Bugis. And then he mentioned Prime Minister. <laughs> he leave it to our liberal thinking to, to visualize whom he was referring to. That's very, very interesting. <laughs> um, yes, uh, so Dr. Rohani, you have to be more liberal than the tree. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. Dr. Saifuddin, whom I know maybe some couple of 20 years ago. Khalid. And I, we were in the Anwas camp, so-called. <laughs> that shows that I'm liberal, am I? <laughs> and Dr. Wong, Tunku, Sosdari, distinguished guest. Am I a liberal? Am I a conservative? Or who am I? I'm a student of security studies. I'm a new classical realist. 
a person who looks at things and development according to the time frame it happened. So, in the main and in the sense, I'm a pragmatic person. I'm open and am a liberal. I'm here today. You must wonder, I think you have been wondering why this Pakasa guy is here. <laughs> Pakasa is racist, left wing, <laughs> extremist. So, allow me to be here today to kill two birds with one stone. One is just a bit of uh, an outreach propaganda about Pakasa, and secondly is to answer one of your puzzles, whether liberalism is detrimental to our society or maybe survival and national security. You know, Pakasa is not just about Ibrahim Ali. <laughs> you know? Pakasa is about me, Ron. New classical realist is about a uh, former general, a former top notch civil servant, and Royal Malaysian Police professionals and the rest. We are not Ibrahim Ali as you perceive, you know. We are not racialists. We are open, we have an outreach exercise even with the Christian group. The Singapore High Commissioner has invited us to talk twice about Malaysia. So that shows so much of racism in, in this country. I'm not. So, secondly, I'm here just to dedicate myself to one very single puzzle. is whether liberalism is detrimental to Malaysian collective national identity. What is actually Malaysian collective national identity? And again, coming back to my background as a student of security and strategic studies, I'm looking and trying to define Malaysian collective identity from what is already being enshrined if our Federal Constitution. Malaysian Federal Constitution contains several orders. Societal order, economic order, administrative and legislative order, and also security order. These are all being constructed and enacted on one single objective. That is to maintain a happy, united, prosperous Malaysia, a single Malaysia, a multi-nation state, or rather a plural state. So now, you know what is uh, Malaysia's uh, legislative order, security order, and the rest. But I'm focusing myself to Malaysia's societal order, this societal order in the constitution has at least four components, major components. One is about citizenship. It's about kerakyatan. Compartmentalized, unfortunately, into one Bumiputra and the rest non Bumiputra. The Bumiputra comprises three other major components the Malays, the Aborigines, and the Ethnics of Sabah and Sarawak. These are all spelled out in Article 161A of the Constitution. And the one about Sarawak is uh, spelled out in 1612, not mistaken. And those about the Nanbumiputra are spelled out in Article, uh, Article 14 to 31 in the Federation uh, Constitution of Malaysia. But, why the, the law of citizenship of Malaysia is enacted in the constitution. Sinadori said that is to dispel fears that if it is in the form of ordinary legislation, it could be blatantly amended whenever there is a change of government or something like that. That means to give constitutional protection to identity of the non Bumiputra of Malaysia. Because in a multi-nation state, a multi-nation state is normally 
a fertile ground for conflict. That's how a student of security look at it. And, and in such a state, the process of nation building and state making is really an uphill battle. So that's why our forefathers, our fighters of independence of multiracial uh, backgrounds, they choose to protect our destiny and our future, our security and our survival in the form of Malaysian constitution. So now my question here is, if liberalism is about personal liberty, is about uh, primacy of individual rights, is about freedom of thought and everything, I'm not against it. If freedom, if liberalism is about liberating our our behavior, or rather our intellectual faculty to explore new knowledge, you know. There's no harm to Malaysian collective identity. But if liberalism is translated as synonymous to total, unrestricted, absolute freedom, irrespective of any limitation in order to maintain national survival and national security, then such a misconceived uh, idea about liberalism could be fatal to our collective identity. Because if we start freely question without any uh, consideration of our national sensitivities, you know, why is this like this? Why the Malays need to enjoy special rights? But they forgot that the non Malays are also protected in the very same article of the Constitution 153 that the non Malays shouldn't be uh, deprived, you know, shouldn't be uh, discriminated. Why Malayu, Bahasa Melayu should be national language? But we must not forget the same article of the constitution say nobody should be prohibited from learning their mother tongue and studying other languages because this societal order in the Malaysian constitution are those uh, clauses and articles that were carefully balanced they were carefully drafted and crafted in such a very flexible manner in order to subscribe to the plurality of our citizen. So that, that is liberal, isn't it, Khalid? Because Tunku Adraman, as uh, Tunku has correctly said it just now, our constitution is based on liberal democracy. You know? But if this liberalism, we have no harm, uh, uh, I'm for it. But if liberalism is misconfused or misconstrued or misunderstood as being uh, absolute freedom without limit, even uh, the Charter of uh, Human Rights has a limitation on, on liberty, on, on security, you know, and on uh, well-being of other people, then I think I may subscribe to a conclusion that such a confused liberalism may be detrimental to our collective national identity. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. I think, uh, well, this is my, my, uh, my, my take on, as I, as I started uh, at the outset, on the, uh, how how do you situate the discourse or the discussion on liberalism in the country is that my, my, my concern is that uh, there are certain uh, sub spheres who just, who may not even allow the discourse on liberalism to take place and would be too quick to, to be, uh, uh, yeah, to label, to stigmatize, yeah. Uh, you know, it's like when you discuss freedom, we all know that there is no such thing as absolute freedom, but some people are too quick to even 
to even not allow uh, the discourse on freedom to take place. I think that is uh, my way of looking at uh, one of the issues pertaining to not so, not so much on the discourse itself, but rather whether the discourse is uh, allowed to flourish and prosper. We have time until 3.30 for Q&A. Uh, may I invite you to, to please uh, go to the mic. Uh, please be brief, uh, state, state your name. You don't have to give your personal account number. <laughs> Just your name and where you are from and your question. Assalamualaikum and good afternoon. Good afternoon, Datuk Saifuddin Abdullah, Datuk Rohani Khalid Jaffa and Dr. Wong Chin Wat and everyone here. Um, I'm representing PCOR, PCOR Voices of Peace, Conscience and Reasons. Okay, on behalf of my president and my vice president, Datin Halima Muhammad Said and Dr. Asma Abdullah, I would like to ask this question to the panelists. To all three? Uh, to all three, okay. yeah. How do we find strategies on how liberalism can coexist in our Malaysian space and value differences? And uh, we need to redefine it based on our local context. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. You. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, question we have today is liberalism compatible with national identity. Okay, I'll try to make this as toned down as possible with a a uh, very particular example, uh, national type schools. So, in, with regards you, to this... You are directing this to all three also? Um, I welcome all three to give inputs on this um, question. Yep. Um, how do you see national school to be um, an element of national identity and how does that in any way, um, how does having national type school itself promotes an element of liberalism, which is, um, and is that compatible with national identity, our construction of national identity? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so can we have these two questions first? Uh, may I invite all the three uh, panelists to respond to the two questions, but can we do it? Reverse now, or you want to take first, Pak Khalid, sila. Before I answer to the two questions, I would like to respond to what was said by Dr. Rohani, my dear friend, from Straits Time days. No liberal thinker or philosopher has presented that yeah, liberalism is total freedom. Yeah? What you're talking is anarchy. It's not liberalism. Yeah? What you're talking is, you're talking about state of nature. Yeah? Where everyone has total freedom. We are not in a state of nature. We are talking about civil government, civil society, not state of nature. State of nature are defined by hopes, yeah? where men uh, live uh, uh, short and what's the Tunku what they say? Short, brutish, and yeah, everyone knows here. Yeah, that is state of nature. Yeah, where there is no law. Yeah, that's why men have to evolve in order for men to survive. Men have to evolve from state of nature into a civil society, where you have to surrender some of your freedom within the law. Law means you have to surrender some of your freedom. So there is no liberalism without rule of law. I mean, this is liberalism 101. We study in, in, in political history 101. Yeah, we didn't never talk here. It's always, I think, it's, it, it is self-serving. All the leaders of Malaysia, I don't know who, yeah, always say that, oh, we can't have yeah, a kebebasan mutla. Who is talking about absolute freedom here? No one is talking about absolute freedom. We are talking about freedom with the rule of law. That is, that is liberalism. Yeah, uh, even libertarian yeah believe in that rule of law. Yeah, uh, so we have to differentiate between liberalism and anarchism or state of nature. What we are saying, 
and all the anti-liberal Malaysian leaders from the very beginning till today, they are talking about present people is anarchy or state of nature, not liberalism. All right? Now, uh, how do we reconcile liberalism with uh, national identity? I don't think we have to reconcile it. We are here. Yeah, we all believe. Anyone here do not believe in liberalism? <laughs> Raise your hand. Yeah, no one. Everyone is liberal. As I say, as I always say, we are all liberal. Right from Ustad Hadi Awang, yeah, to Ustad Abdullah Zai, yeah, because all of them believe in democracy. You can't believe in democracy unless you are liberal, because you have a constitution, yeah. All of them believe in free trade. Yeah, uh, you can't be a free trader unless you are a liberal. All of them believe in rule of law. Yeah, so these are our identity, part and parcel of identity, at least uh, a, a modern national identity. But before that, yeah, before we have, uh, before uh, the British came, before Panko engagement, yeah, we have. A sense of law and order, rule of law, yeah, as adat law mentioned by Tupac Abidin or as Sharia, yeah, and people believe in private property. Yeah. These are core elements of uh, liberalism. Yeah, no, no one here believes in a commune uh, society where uh, you don't have a family, you don't have a wife, and you don't own property. Everyone believe in private property. Everyone believe in free trade. Everyone now uh, 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 responsibility. And in modern time, we believe in uh, constitutional government. Yeah, we are not here for uh, absolute monarchy. We believe in uh, constitutional monarchy and parliamentary democracy. Yeah, and and Ruko Negara, which we read all the times uh, in schools. Yeah, these are our integral national identity. Of course, there are a lot of things that we need to pursue further. Yeah? We have to abolish progressively uh, unnecessary, illiberal uh, restriction uh, within freedom, within the framework of law. Yeah? I think this, this needs to be done. Yeah? Uh, the abridgment of fundamental liberties, yeah? freedom of speech, of uh, uh, thought and all those things. Yeah. Uh, we need to uh, educate the society, we need to engage the society, we need to engage all sectors. I think... Uh, but you, you, you want to attend to the next question? The yeah. yeah. The next question with regard to uh, the uh, vernacular schools. Malaysian society from the very beginning is a plural society. That is a part of our national identity. Yeah? I disagree with earlier notion of nationalism yeah? to achieve a national, to forge a national uh, identity as well as national solidarity, we should eliminate the vernacular school. I don't believe in that way. But now the argument for a national school no longer a national identity or national solidarity. But we require uh, Mandarin now because uh, the biggest economy will be China and also rising India also, so that helps us economically. So I think uh, uh, the existence, the presence of, of the two uh, systems, I think, will contribute towards a more cosmopolitan Malaysia, which is part and parcel of our national identity. Thank you, but uh, yeah, that's right. Thank you. Do you, Khalid, wish to, do, do you wish to be emotional? <laughs> do you wish to rebut Khalid first? No, I'm not going to rebut him because I am I have nothing against liberalism. I said if, but I may have used the wrong word. Yeah. Is uh, being anarchist. If if liberalism is being being misunderstood as anarchy, then it will be total uh, fatal uh, uh, destiny for us, you know what I mean? So I'm not, I'm not against liberalism, Kali. So please, get me right, I think. <laughs> All right. So now, what is strategy? Strategy is, uh, strategy is a mean and approach or a plan, how do we achieve 
our objective you know these uh, these these approaches uh, needs uh, articulation on how we want to choose whether we want to approach thing through a peaceful means whether we want to approach certain things through cohesive means or some other democratic way or through a liberal perspective you know that's what strategy is all about and strategy could only be successful if it is being uh, formulated according to our resources of what we have our strength our manpower and our our wealth or something like that secondly about the national school and vernacular school about mother tongue scholar bukan concern to me there's no harm because malaysia as khalid has correctly said it again is actually nobody question that malaysia is a multinational state is a plural state we are not like the us where we can choose a special brand of melting pot you know because malaysia was born as a new political entity based on the malays the, the aborigines and other ethnic as the core uh race at that time and then plus the chinese and the indians from through different parts of the world with different civilization and geographical background so in order to be a new state we have actually choices in security you can choose either you get rid of our previous identity and build on a fresh collective identity which is maybe could be very brutal or we build a new identity by assimilating and accommodating the existing ones before the independence or rather through a constitutional or policy means this what nation's choice is that's why our process of state making and state building is mostly guided and strictly guided by our constitution by our rukun negara by our rempah ratus as you said just now you know so this why malaysian identity is based on another approach another platform which is uh, actually a model being studied by other countries that is model of consociationalism this where we share our destiny build on common uh, a common understanding to build a new life in a particular area based on a consensus and a choice of try to to live together peacefully and prosperously you know so malaysian uh, model of uh, nation building and process making or rather national integration is based on the principle of uh, consociationalism that's why one of the, the the current ruling party unfortunately from 1957 is a combination of uh, the malays chinese and indian and other parties built up and blended together based on the politics and democracy of constitutionalism you see and constitutionalism is a principle principle now being studied even in in ireland how people of different uh, civilization different belief religion and maybe economic backgrounds can live together in a new nation based on common understanding and agreement among the principal uh, groupings in that very country to build a new identity based on the new political identity so that's those are the one but a bit about what dr wong said uh, about identity identity is not remparatus Remparatus is just uh, spices uh, to make things more delicious, like ajinomoto and something like that. Identity is a very structural uh, element or components of a state, because identity can determine whether the new political entity being built will be fragile, will be weak, or can can turn into a failed state. you know irrespective whether the 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 one who build that state is of liberal leaning conservative leaning democratic or socialist leaning 
So identity is not just a rempah ratus, not spices. Identity is something very structural, something very vital, something very, very important to become the structure of a new political identity or political entity. In our case, to become the pillar and the structure of Malaysia or rather the independent uh, post-colonial Malaya at that time. So that is what our collective identity means. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I, I would love to engage uh, Atul Rohani on uh, Article 153.160, Concessionalism, but time will allow it. Uh, well, we shall see. Uh, I, I wouldn't take uh, Bakhalid's catch-all approach and definitions of, of liberal or liberalism because otherwise then everyone becomes either liberals or reverted liberals. <laughs> uh, what I want to go zoom in is on a key assumption, or at least from where I see, that is vital in liberalism. Now, the whole idea of liberalism is not just about the moral idea that people should be free to do what they do. There's a very strong utilitarian assumption behind that, that we are rational. You see, I, I haven't heard of people who talk about and say, let's have liberalism because, you know, despite irrationality. The argument is actually tied down to that. So you really come back to this whole idea of when we want to examine whether people believe in liberalism or not, is to ask whether do they believe in reason. At the end of the day, do you believe people can make a decision? There are of course some of the, act, some of the decisions, or some of the behaviours that are clearly out of the bound. But what about in between? Are people allowed to make their choice? Or we cannot trust them because some other people would know better than what is best for them. That's the question we need to deal with. Now, uh, we all know Charles Darwin's masterpiece, The Origin of Species. The English edition of that book is physically available in our library, is legally available. The in we do not have a Malay edition. The Indonesian edition has been banned since 2006. Why? According to the Home Ministry, it's a threat to national security. Why? Because it teaches evolutionism. Now, what's the problem with that? The problem here is that it's supposed to protect the Muslim faith. But Muslims read English as well. So what's wrong when they read English is all right. For them, their mind to be contaminated. But if they read only Malays, then we need to police their mind. Those are issues that we need to deal with. These are issues that are really at stake here. That even a national language has been made a tool of control. At the end of the day, what we need to ask here is not about specific institutions, specific rules. It's about do we have a room for reason in public and private affairs in Malaysia? That's the question. No other larger question, more relevant question than this. So if we go back to Article 153, <clears throat> 160, we may agree or disagree on anything. The whole question here is that are people allowed to question it? It's two different things to question and then to make a decision on it, right? Now, to make a decision, you always go back to majority, or in the case of constitutional provision, we opt for super majority. In the case of Malaysia, two thirds. The idea is to make sure that you have a large enough majority to convince or to force the minority to accept the reality rather than people are split in the middle. But do we have the room to question this? Now, I, I do not share a, a full position that the constitution uh, was a liberal document. Certainly not in the current form, not after 1969. With Article 10, Clause 4, which bar us from questioning four parts of the Constitution on citizenship, 
Article 152, Article 153, and 181. Now bear in mind, Islam is not there. Religion was not an issue in the aftermath of May 13. My point here is that if we accept liberalism, that means we should accept the legitimate role of reason in decision making. We must allow free debate. No matter how unhappy we are to a certain position, we must allow the other person to speak. In so far, the person does not take up arm. That's all we should ask. Now, is Malaysia a liberal country? I would say no. We are far from that. And that's why I appreciate the efforts by uh, Ideas and, and University of Nottingham. I hope the University of Nottingham won't get into trouble for that. <coughs> to, to, to put forward this, we need to examine all these questions. So coming back to the first question from the floor, I think it's really about can we trust our reason? Now, theoretically, there's, it is possible for us not to trust ourselves. How? If Malaysians are somewhat genetically defective, then we shouldn't trust ourselves. Because the German may be able to think for themselves, uh, you know, the Australian may be able to think for themselves, the British may be thinking for themselves. But Malaysian, maybe for whatever reason, we are somewhat defective. Then we shouldn't have liberalism because we are not equipped to use reason. Now, no matter how liberal you are, I have not come across a liberal who would advocate for full rights for animals. Why? Because animals are not supposed to have the human intelligence we do. So if we are willing to accept the fact that somewhat we are inferior in terms of intelligence, then I say, let's curtail liberalism. Because liberty indeed can be dangerous. I want to now go to uh, the second questions on school from Razan, right? <coughs> now, I'm not a million liberal, I'm a Madisonian liberal. Uh, to put that simple, I believe in division. I don't believe in unity. Uh, why? Because I believe that human nature is not so bright. We tend to bully other people. So the best way to keep human beings in the best position is to make sure bullying is not profitable or beneficial to the bullies, right? So I don't believe in, I don't believe in unity except for one sense, that the unity to uphold an inclusive political system. To me, that's my identity. That's what I would stand for as a constitution. I may disagree with part of, part of the contents, but as long as this is in force, this is what I defend for. And I, and I once, um, we have a, a, a politician called Ahmad Ismail, uh, that was about 2008, Penang, he called, uh, from Amno. he called the Chinese and the Indians uh, squatters. And there were people who say, put him under ISA, Internal Security Act so that he, he would shut up, so that we would not be heard. I say, no. I wrote a piece, I say, Ahmad Ismail is my brother. Not because I like him, but the fact that we are born in this country, we are part, we share the citizenship, I have to defend his right. He is a brother I don't like, but he deserves my defense, that's it. And that's all what we need for a liberal nation, not the specific content, because that's a matter of taste. What I like, I shouldn't impose on you. Now, coming back to the idea of division, if you go back to the Madisonian idea, we need to actually prevent to have, we need to prevent homogeneity. And therefore, I don't believe in a single, single type of school. We need to have as many possible types of school to suit different needs. What is the problem? The problem is if, at the moment, our system is specialization by language. The problem with that system if it's coincide overlap fully with the ethnic line, meaning that if everyone speaks the language, go into that school. We do have a problem because that creates segregation. But the problem is not having more school, having more different types of school. What's wrong with that? Why should we go and police what kind of contents accept a certain basic, reasonable uh, standards, right? We should let that be. What we need to create is 
cross-cutting cross-cutting cleavages, meaning that you would you break up the Malays by getting them to different school, you break up the Chinese from getting them to different school, you break up the Tamils, the Kadazan, everyone going to different school. So when it comes to any issue, they may join together, but when it comes to language, they break up and they fight among themselves. That's what we need. You want people to fight without permanent enemies and friends. So people become more rational in fighting. Yeah, so that's what I think. Thank you. Okay, that was positive fighting. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, brothers and sisters, I'm afraid I can't uh, open uh, the floor to more questions. We are already two minutes past uh, 3.30. Uh, if I may allow to do three short, very, very brief, uh, not conclusion remarks. Number one, I believe the organizer, uh, the organizers are influenced by uh, latest developments in politics. That is why suddenly you have the term detrimental being used. That must be penal code uh, section 124B. But from the friendly banters that we have, we are assured that liberalism is not detrimental to uh, parliamentary democracy in Malaysia because article, sorry, uh, section 30 of the penal code says that it is only detrimental when it is violence and through unconstitutional means. So if Pakasa can be very friendly with us, oh, sorry, saja je nak kacau, then uh, there is no violence. <laughs> no, 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 just joking, just joking. Uh, Second, I think we need to have more of this kind of discussion. Remember, I started by saying there are some people who are allergic. I think we need to impress upon people. You don't have to be allergic with the term liberalism. We have more to learn, or more to benefit rather than learn, more to benefit uh, than to limit uh, uh, this discussion. Number three, and this comes, I suppose, in passing uh, from the three speakers, uh, not necessarily all of them, is I think uh, this politics of consocialism, which is, yeah, uh, which is what uh, the arrangement, the bargaining of the different race and ethnics in the country, uh, yes, it has served us well to a certain extent, but I think there is now a growing need, in fact, people are already discussing a more centrist approach to Malaysian politics. Already people are talking about the need for Malaysia to have a proper, if not necessarily the best, but a proper multiracial political talks. So it's not just about multiracial political parties, but bring the discourse to a higher level, uh, to a more mature and progressive level of democracy, where we talk about serious, genuine, real, multiracial political thoughts. By the way, that is what I'm going to speak about tomorrow in another. That, that's, that was my my way of you know uh, campaigning uh, propaganda for my session <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> uh, brothers and sisters, give a big hand to all the three speakers. Uh, over to you, uh, sister.